Uh, we're in the third chapter, and we're looking at verse 13. We're going through the book of 1 Thessalonians. <clears throat> a great mission book. You recall that Paul only got to spend three weeks. He went in and evangelized the, the Thessalonians and, uh, Thessalonians and, and um, got run out of town. <laughs> got run out of town. But he left a wonderful group of people. And he only got three weeks to nurture them in the word. And it bothered Paul that he had to leave so early and not have them grounded in, in enough faith to uh, withstand the angelic conflict because he knew as soon as he left the area, the devil was going to try to usurp authority again, as he always does. And, uh, and he wound up in Athens on his missionary trip, and uh, he had a team with him. And the next thing you read in his account in Athens that he was left alone. And then we discover what he was doing. He sent his guys back out, uh, Titus and all these guys. He sent them back to mission fields to, to, uh, to really get a good look and see, get a report on how well the, the different ones were doing. And he sent Timothy back to uh, Thessalonica to check on these believers. And uh, Paul writes a, a, a wonderful endearing. Remember when you read this, and, and truly, 1 Thessalonians, truly an epistle. I mean, sometimes we call all, write, all of Paul's writings epistles, but truth of the matter is, this really is a personal letter. And Paul, Paul uh, often uh, bears his, the burdens of his heart to these people as a missionary, as a teacher of the word of God, and how concerned he was for their welfare spiritually. And it's a wonderful little book. And... Um, so we're going to study verse 13 uh, today in a moment. We looked at it last week. Uh, it, but remember, when you pick up your informational sheet here, your bulletin, Ernie will have the second half today, the second service. Uh, ladies of the Lord, their conference is coming in at the end of the month. Uh, be a heavy weekend. And if you have any, uh, any a questions about it, ask uh, Jackie. She can sure fill you in on that. Uh, be, be, it will be held this year at the church. Also, um, this is uh, the last week for registration. If you want to go to the School of Biblical Theology uh, quarter, we're teaching anthropology and Hebrews. We're introducing Hebrews. Uh, and so <clears throat> you can't afford, <laughs> let me tell you right now, you can't afford to miss a week of Hebrew. So uh, if you want to sign up, see Ernie. Uh, this is the last week for sign up on that. And the, and the rest of the I information on this bulletin, uh, you should read and take. It's, a, it's for prayer. <laughs> I, I don't know what you think that bulletin is for, but we design it and send it out and give it to you. The idea is for prayer. And, and we put a lot of different uh, ministries and needs and uh, besides the ones you already have. So... Let's read 13, then we'll have a word of prayer. And remember about the book of 1 Thessalonians. This is really interesting now. Every chapter in, in 1 Thessalonians ends in eschatology. Every chapter ends in eschatology. That's a word, a doctrinal statement pertaining to the second coming of Christ. Every chapter. And that really strikes me interesting because he's so concerned for their, for their spiritual growth from a baby believer just recently converted. He only spent, had three weeks to spend with them before he had to leave town. And he's really concerned about are they able to withstand the assault of Satan upon their faith? And it really bothered him about that. And we've already read chapter 1 and 2 where he's really opened up his heart to them about this and he just can't wait to get back to them and encourage them. Remember he said to encourage, exhort, and implore you in your faith. And, and it, it, it just struck me interesting that he was so concerned about their spiritual well-being and, and the angelic conflict upon their life that he closed every chapter with a statement about the second coming of Christ. 
that interesting? I don't know in all of my days of thinking and pastoring, I would have ever thought to do that. But the truth of the matter is, the eminence of the return of Christ for the church is what should keep our feet to the fire and our minds focused on the Lord Jesus Christ because he could come at any instant of any second of any day. And that was a great reminder to me as I read that, and I thought, my, my, isn't that interesting that, that he would, every chapter he closes with a statement. And so we have one in 13, verse 13. I'm in the third chapter. This third one he's, he's given. <clears throat> he says, remember, that's verse 11, 12, and 13. If you have a study Bible, you, you will know that. That's a section that Paul was interested in. And in verse 13, and so, and, and the reason that's important, listen to me. Look up here a moment. <laughs> I can feel my engine starting, so I'm wanting to start to preach, but I haven't had prayer yet. But verse 11 and 12 have three operatives in the Greek language. Now, an operative is just a unique verbal form. <clears throat> and it's a hopeful wish or desire. The operative, just by itself. Just by itself. Just by itself. And not even looking at the verb to which it's attached. Just the operative within itself. means I have a hopeful desire for this. In verse 11, he gives one operative in, in the word direct. In verse 12 and 13, he uses the word increase and abound. Those are operatives. He does that, so when he gets to verse 13, he says, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a, a directional, that's ice plus the accusative, that's a directional this is where you get the idea of the directive will of God. Ice plus the accusative is directional. And uh, in this passage, 11, 12, and 13, 13, it's used three times. Now, we talked about that last time. You've probably forgotten that, but that's not my problem. Uh, mine is just to teach it and recall for you. But when you get to verse 13, see the word so that? That's ice plus the accusative. And it's directing the three operatives to look at something uniquely and special about the will of God that's pertinent to their life. And it's the evidence of the return of Christ. Just think about that. My wife in her last days, she lived in the expectation of two things. One was dying. No more pain, no more suffering, no more whatever. And the eminence of the return of Christ. Think about that. When I read this, that's what I think about. You know, both of these Two things, and in the meantime, if those ne neither of those happens, then what do you do? You walk by faith and not by sight, don't you? <clears throat> but I found that interesting in her life. She's, she was ready to take either one of those options <clears throat> because she didn't see going back anywhere. She could only see going forward. There was no going back. She was at a place in her life. She couldn't go back. You know, this is like, not like a flu or something. Can't go back. It's not going to get better tomorrow. <clears throat> and so I, when I read, read this, and, and I thought, but Paul did, he, he talked about the eminence of Christ. He gave him a, a doctrine. But this time, he really did it interesting. In chapter, in chapter 3, when he does this one, he ties that up really neat. The word direct, the word increase, the word abound are operatives that now come into play with the word so that, ice, 
directing you to some specific will of God that's important to what you're going through. Know that what you're going through, the Lord is going to direct your path. Know that he's going to increase his love towards you and know that that love that he's increased to you should go out of you and abound to others. Three optives. Because here is the importance of the will of God to your life. No matter what you're going through. No matter what you're going through. No matter, no matter what, what, what you're holding to by the skin of your teeth. Here's what he tells you. Hold on to this. So that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father. That's in his presence. These three operatives. So that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness. In the presence of God and our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints. Yeah, when the saints go marching in. You know, that was a, that was a wonderful idea for David Wijnand. He loved that song. When the saints go marching in. <laughs> well, let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through the third chapter, verse 3, will give you that information. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Could be mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, or overt sins to give you an idea. How do I get out of carnality back into the spirituality of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit that lives inside my body? I confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. That word cleansing takes you back to verse 7. And takes you to the blood of Christ. Takes you back to the cross. Here I am as a believer confessing my sin and I'm standing at the cross. The last time I stood at the cross, it was for my salvation. This time for my personal sin. Not for Adam's sin that's in my life, but my own that's in my life. And why, why does the blood of Christ need to work? How does that work for me? In confession of sin, sanctification. When I came for salvation, it was for justification. When I come back to the cross for confession of sin, it's for sanctification. For the great ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, I can't live in the flesh. I need to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Personal sin says you haven't been doing that. Our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us the Word of God. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth. The truth is what sets us free from the cosmic system of lies of the God of this world. 1 John 5, 18. We're so thankful, Father, for these that have come. I pray today the Holy Spirit would teach and recall. For it is the power of the dynamics of the Christian life where he focuses. Put your eyes on Jesus. Focus upon him and his teachings, and his life in us. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we are. In this idea in verse 13, he says that he, the Lord, that was important with all the operatives, and now we're in an aorist, we're in an aorist infinitive. I want to go back to all that, an articulate aorist infinitive in the word establish. It means to set your hearts means to set something that's broken, to fix it, to mend it. And uh, he uses that with a, an aorist act of infinitive, which we talked a great deal about last week, and I'm not going to go back. But this whole thing is directing you 
uh, in the midst of whatever you're going through to the directive will of God and especially pertaining the doctrine of the second coming of Christ and the eminence of the return of Christ. Now, he, he says, may the Lord do this. May the Lord establish your hearts blameless. That's, that's, that's living without blame. Without blame. That's used a lot with the second coming of Christ, by the way. You know, when he comes back, he don't get caught with your pants down kind of business. So that's that idea. So he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. Now, interesting, I told you before, on, on Greek words, you always look for prefixes and suffix. What's on the front of a, a, a word, it could be a noun or a verb, and what's on the backside? On the backside of a verb is dynamic. <laughs> For example, the operative. But on a noun, you pay attention to, to what is on the, uh, what's on the suffix, the, the, the tail. What is wagging? You look at the tail. And this is hagias sune. It ends in a S-U-N-E. And we talked about that uh, and told you last time to pay attention to that type of thing. Uh, when you're studying. And so I don't want to go back and hash all that because I did that before. We talked about that. He wants to establish your heart blameless in holiness, that sanctification, before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all, the, the should be all there, with all his saints. Notice I put the word <coughs> with the suffix S-U-N-E. <coughs> when you see that, it... It's referring to, now listen to me, because Haggai's, it could be the Holy Bible, Holy God, uh, Saint, uh, you know, Haggai's. When you add something on the front or back of it, it it's, it's when you got S-U-N-E on the, on the back side of that, like we do in this one, holiness, holiness. <clears throat> it's referring to a specific quality or characteristics of God's holiness. Something that is unique uh, to the Christian life, no matter what he's going through. And the idea is sanctification. The doctrine of this would be sanctification. Sanctification. Now, here's the problem. <clears throat> you use a word like this in a typical church today, first of all, they don't know it. And second of all, they don't understand if you talk about a specific characteristic or category or some aspect of it that would be important to the second coming of Christ. What part of sanctification would be important to the second coming of Christ? All right? Point number one. We're going to find out. Point number one. Uh, there are three phases to New Covenant sanctification. That is New Testament. And you always pay attention to the S-U-N-E because they're going to either contextually is going to refer to one of these three. It's either going to be positional sanctification, experiential sanctification, or ultimate sanctification. There it is. Now, your context is going to determine which one of these is. And so I need to explain positional, experiential, and ultimate so that we can see which one he's talking about because he used S-U-N-E saying a specific qualification or a specific characteristic or something unique about the doctrine of sanctification. Because that, that's sanctification. So when, you, when you're dealing with, there are three phases to the plan of God, we know it. Salvation, Christian life, and eternity, the believer. Now when you apply them to the overall plan of God, you got phase one, sanctification. Phase two, sanctification. Phase three, sanctification. Now, we have specific terms for them to help you distinguish between them. Salvation, we call it positional sanctification. For the Christian way of life, we refer to it experiential sanctification. And for the believer in eternity, we refer to it as ultimate sanctification. Al mentioned those the other day uh, when, he, when he spoke. Now, let's just see. This could be a gate question. The Lord is just, you know, he, he might be in a sense of humor that day when you get there. And so he'll go like, well, I know you know there are three, 
the fact that you're here, which one of these, uh, which one of the sanctifications, number one, number two, or number three, is applied to your life today? Could you answer that? Three, number three. Well, there you go. Don's ready. We hope he's got more years, but he's ready to take the gate question. See, when you're dealing with the second coming, you know what you got, right? If you're dealing with salvation, you know what kind of sanctification he's talking about. <clears throat> That's really important. You know that. So I gave you scriptures, like on positional sanctification. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, 14. Now listen, when I, 13 through 15. When I give you these on this paper... You tell me what you're supposed to do when you go home with this piece, but I better not find that laying around. What, what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do with that? All the scriptures I give you. You're supposed to look them up and study them. I only got one hour. You can't get that in one hour. Yeah, study this stuff. I've been sitting where you sat. I'd go home and study like crazy to figure out what that guy just told me. Now what? So there's, that's a good one, too. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, 4. Hebrews 13, 12 says, it's the blood of Christ. It is the blood of Christ that brings you into, a sanctific into positional sanctification. The blood of Christ. If you don't, listen, if you don't believe that Jesus died for your sins, blood, was buried and raised from the dead, third gospel, you're not going to get any sanctification. It's out. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, quote, shed his blood business, was buried and raised from the dead third day. You know, two things about Christ on the cross are really important theologically, his body and his blood. How important is it? It's the Eucharist. There's no Christian church where it's earth salt that doesn't do a Eucharist. The bread and the cup. The body and the blood of Christ is everything about him hanging on the cross. He born outside a damning sin. He kept himself pure from it until he died on the cross. Impeccable. He who knew no sin, knew no, knew no. That's not Spanish now. Knew no. Not, not speaking Spanish to you. So you got to believe, and, and there's where the blood is. And what did the blood do for me? It it got me nine. It got me nine. It got me redemption, reconciliation, propitiation, sanctification, justification. It got me peace with God. It got me th these nine things that are important to your salvation. That are given to you by grace. You're redeemed by grace. You're reconciled by grace. All of these are grace attributes in your life. And that big package of the gospel, the fact that you get the nine works of the Holy Spirit, he's buried and raised from the dead, and the power that raised from the dead lives inside your mortal body. You know that Romans 8, 9, 10, and 11? Lives inside your mortal body. The Holy Spirit that raised God from the, that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside your mortal bodies. So this is what Paul's talking about. How this all begins. In 1 Corinthians 6, 11, I wrote it on your paper. Such were some of you, but you were washed, cleansed. There's the blood. But you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. That's positional sanctification. You can read the other ones, Acts 26, 18. In phase two, you got the Christian way of life. I refer to it as experiential sanctification because it is experiential. I think Al referred the other day to it, and good, he used practical. And the one thing I loved about that is he kept all those in P words. So I, I like that kind of thing. Uh, positional, practical, and permanent, if I remember right. Say, I, I listen to everybody and learn. Experiential sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 3.13, listen, what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to hold myself under the concept of being blameless at the second coming of Christ. How do I do that? But, oh, yeah, that's a big test. Listen, 
The law people tell you you got to live by the law. What do the grace people tell you? They better tell you sanctification. They better tell you sanctification. They better tell you holiness. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's not the ministry of the flesh. And it's, it's not some kind of wild thing, well, God will figure it out in the end and it'll come out okay. Sanctification is holiness. Holds yourself blameless in hope. I didn't write this stuff, people. That he may establish your hearts without blame, without blame in holiness. How do I do that without blame? In holiness is how I do that. How do I do that? Listen, I walk and live by the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. Every day of every moment of the day, if you believe in the eminence of the second coming of Christ. Agreed? Well, apparently not. I don't care. It's up to you whether you believe it or not. But listen. Listen. That aspect ought to change your life. Living, living every moment of every day. Well, that's a lot to ask of me. Well, you live every moment of every day. Why is it too much to ask? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I must ask you, where are you directing your time and energy and what you're looking to carry you from a.m. to p.m.? <laughs> Jeez. Come on, people. And so here we have 1 Thessalonians 3.13. We have Acts 20.32, which I'm going to read in a moment. We have a wonderful passage in 2 Corinthians 7.1. 7, 1. 7, 1. Listen to Acts 20.32. And now I recommend, I, I recommend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. You know, you know what the, these people are called? Saints. They're called saints. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit, not only are they positionally in Christ through the Holy Spirit, but they live that way in the power of the Holy Spirit. Saints. When did I become a saint? The moment I got saved. So why, God, why does God call me a saint? Because he wants you to live in holiness. That's what a saint is, one who lives in holiness. How do I do that? By the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. How do I do that? Galatians, Galatians 5, 16, you, you walk. And that's a command, by the way. <laughs> that's a command. That's a, that's a standing command. It's a present imperative in Greek. And there's a promise attached to it. Watch this. If I walk... And I'm commanded to, by means of the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, I will not fulfill the desires of the flesh, which, which according to James 1, 13 through 15, is personal sin. Isn't that interesting? The third phase is ultimate sanctification. This is a believer in eternity. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, I wrote it on your paper. For, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 10. That's a good one. And that should be, <laughs> that should be, I don't really know what I was doing there. But that's 1 Thessalonians 4, believe it or not, 13 through 18, which is one of the great passages out of this book on the rapture of the church. When he gets to the end of the fourth chapter, he'll talk about the rapture. I was really, I was, I was really getting tired, wasn't I? I was really getting tired. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself. Notice his title. As that Romans 5.1 business that carries you to eternity. That's a Romans 5.1 that takes you into eternity. Now may the God of peace himself or alone. Sanctify you entirely. Now, what does that mean? Your spirit, your soul, and your body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 5 of our book. 
chapter 5, point number 2. Every church-age believer receives positional sanctification the moment he or she believes that Jesus died for their sins personally, not academically, personally. Let me tell you, I'm going to pound this pretty good while because it's really come home, a rooster come home to, to uh, a chicken. I don't know if a rooster ever nests, but I don't want to throw away all my farm secrets. But I use Galatians 2.20 to check people because I find in the South, everybody's grown up in the church and everybody's got academic knowledge of salvation but it may not be personal. It's got to be personal. can't be academic. If that's all you're going to do, it's not going to get you there. you got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Listen to what Galatians 2.20 says. I was crucified with Christ. That's about as personal you can get, the eye, isn't it? Eyes, is, eyes personal were great. Eyes personal? Listen, I, I, I is the first person. <laughs> I, I is the first person. Right? Not the second, not third. I mean, that's, they, that's the one who dreams at night and gets you in trouble. Die. I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in Christ, I live by the faith of Christ. I mean, how simple is that? It's got to be that. I mean, there's, I mean, a lot of people, they, listen, they've got a lot of information. They, they can quote the books of the Bible and they can do all kinds of stuff. The question is, have you made the, the crucifixion of Christ for your sins personal? I'm telling you. We should, oh, we, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, 14. We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved. Look at, look, at, look at those status words. Beloved, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen, look at that word, you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and in the truth. It was for this that he called you. Look at that. These are all grace words that I'm, I'm giving you. Giving thanks that he called you through our gospel that you may give glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that personal? God, geez. Pretty personal, isn't it? Pretty personal. Point number three. Experiential sanctification. There are two important doctrines associated with experiential sanctification. That's it. Sanctification working in a believer's life. And boy, you better learn these. And there's a reason why they're different. One's called the filling, and one's called the walking. Being filled by the Holy Spirit and walking by the Holy Spirit, both are present imperatives. They are not the same thing. God knows vocabulary. He knows when he refers to somebody being saved, sozo, and he's going to call it that all the time. i got to call it something else. You know, but God don't have a problem with vocabulary. We do. Both these are enormously important to experiential sanctification because they have present imperatives. That's a standing command in the Greek language. If there's a negative with it, and often there is, then it means stop doing it or don't do it. If you're doing it, stop it. I mean... Stop it right now and quit doing that. And if you haven't do it, don't don't pick that up. Don't get get you don't get engaged in that deal. All right. If there's a negative, if there's a, if there's a may or an ook, an m e or an o o u k, then you have a negative attached to it. Uh, don't do that. Now, both of these, both the filling ministry. And the walking ministry, walk by means of the power of the Holy Spirit, be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, are present imperatives. 
Okay? Both are present and fair. These are commands. They're standing commands. Well, Ron, you don't know my life. You don't know what I've been going through. If you knew what I was going through, you'd throw that stuff. I'm just not you know that. <laughs> standing command, it don't matter. It's not what's going on around you. It's what's going on in you. Just saying. The first one I want to mention is the filling. The filling ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit found in Ephesians 5.18. And it's really interesting how he states it. And the way he states it confuses a lot of people. Here's what he said. Do not get drunk with wine. For that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit. Notice, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a positive against a negative. Here's a positive against a negative. What's the negative? What's the negative? Don't get drunk. Now, he could have just as well said, don't be glutton. He could have used food, but apparently he was, drink he was talking to some people that couldn't, couldn't hold the alcohol. Right? In the South, we probably wouldn't use drunk. We'd probably use food. <laughs> No, don't glutton. There's a negative. Do not do that. Do not get drunk. And then he describes it. Now listen. He tagged it because apparently goes, well, I don't know what you mean by that. How, what's drunk? Well, I think he got it. I think you could, let's, let's take a picture of him so when he wakes up in the morning and gets sober, he'll know what drunk is when he says, well, how much is, how much is enough? Well, we'll take a picture of him and say, well, we know that is. Look, he didn't even go there. He didn't go like I might with a bunch of kids. He didn't even go there. He said, for that is dissipation. I don't know what you think dissipation is. You can look it up in the dictionary. But the Greek word is very interesting. I wrote it down because that's the negative side to a positive. Look, A-S-O-T-I-A. That A on the front is an alpha privative. But when you put this together, it means excess and riotous living. Now, let me ask you, you old Bible students, you ever heard any parable that Jesus gave with riotous living in it? Huh? Yeah, well, I said, I said a parable of Jesus, not a parable of you. All right? Luke 15. You know, when he dealt with the coins, the, the sheep and the sons, remember that? The youngest son, he had two. He talks about the two boys in there. The, the younger son who went off, right? And he gazed in that very thing right there. Excessive, riotous living. This, this word is used. So if you want an example of that, of dissipation, well, what do you mean by dissipation? Well, he said, you know, get drunk with wine, but what does it mean by well, it, it, it can affect a lot of other areas of your life. Because it's uncontrollable lust of your sin nature that you're living by. It's the uncontrollable lust of your sin nature. You just give in to it. I just, I'm a free-spirited person, man. And I just hate it all out. Well, there's a guy in the Bible like you. Let me tell you where all that going to wind up. You're going to wind up. So you ought to read this story, right? From the 11th to the 17th, ch chapter 15, 11 through, till he gets back home. <laughs> Riotous living, excessive, giving in to every impulse 
of feeding the flesh got him in a pig pen eating with pigs. I literally pig pens. And you know what the cause was? Excessive behavior. Excessive behavior of uncontrolled lust of the flesh. Just letting it go. And, and listen, it doesn't matter whether, it doesn't matter where that lust gratification power it is, doesn't matter if it's food or alcohol or sex or, or, or gyms, going to gyms or running. You know, you can run 26 miles a day and still have a heart attack. How do you figure that out? There has to be temperance in that whole business. Not telling you you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying, look, it, it, it's the excess of riotous living uh, of the flesh, just gratifying the flesh. That's what this is discussing about. And so don't engage in that lifestyle. Rather engage in this. Be filled by means of the Holy Spirit who lives inside you. Now the word filled. That's an interesting word. If you research that thing in the Greek language and, and go there and, and look up the different passages and study what you're going to have, you're going to find it boils down to one thing. It's a deficiency. You're trying to fill a deficiency. It means the English word is wonderful, fill, but you don't know what you mean by that. Do you want me to, you want me to fill it a quarter? or half, or full. See, it, in the English, when you put that, and it's a good translation, when you put it in the word fill, be filled, the opposite to it is don't engage in excessive, riotous living, which I explained. The alternative is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will meet all the deficiencies that you're going to the world to get, all the deficiencies that you're going to the world to get, power, uh, advantages, uh, self-recognition, whatever that stuff is. What you need is the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. It is that Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit as person. It's the third member of the Godhead. Has all the characteristics of God inside you. You've got to learn to walk in the power of the dynamics of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And being filled with it, the Holy Spirit will meet all of your needs in this life, in this world. You don't have to go to the world because it never fills a deficiency. It winds up running you on empty. It's the opposite of filled. It's empty. Read the story of the prodigal. It will leave you empty. Then you can't go to the world to fill up what God has given you by grace. Gosh. Can you not get that? Can you not get that? And that's a standing command. Don't go to the world for anything. To fill up a deficiency. Boy, are we learning that in this COVID. If you learn nothing else, boy, you're learning this one. This word that's used here, A-S-O-T-I-A, is also used for lascivious behavior. And a good example of that, I used to preach this to young people all the time. Probably Joe sat in the sessions with me at Troy University. And I would preach 1 Peter 4.4, 4, which has this idea in it. Uses that word. Let me close. Close. 
The second important ministry of experiential sanctification is walking. Perry Pateo. I tell you this all the time. Perry Pateo in the Greek language, when it refers to your personal life, like it does here, and that's a present of Perry. Whenever you draw a circle on your paper and put a dot in the middle, that circle is your life and that dot is you. This is Perry Pateo. It means in every activity of your life. And then you stop and you think, at any given day, what does my life consist of? And it changes weekly, doesn't it? Probably, if you, if you work, or monthly, or... I look back there and see the old ones, and oh my God. The only reason God would send you north is to be missionaries. And the only reason they would, they would take, he would not take you from me and send you to Ohio if he's not going to make missionaries out of you. I mean, you're going to have the time of your life for God. You're going to have the, you're going to have the time of your life back amongst the Yankees. And you keep your eye on God because it's, it's, whatever you think you're going there for is not what it's about. That's the only, that's the only way God could get you there. There's <laughs> no way you'd go on your own. No more than I would have come to the South. You keep your eyes open. The second ministry is the walking ministry. Perry Pateo, and you put a dot in the middle, and then you, 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 put, you section it off into pieces of pie, I call it. And every day, God wants you, that's your, that's your circle of influence, and he wants you to walk, to walk in that circle with family, and everybody that's your life's attached to is in that circle. And he wants your life to touch that circle every day in, in the dynamics of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He wants you to touch that out of Galatians 5, 16, and 17. Not with your flesh. He don't want you to minister your flesh in that circle. He wants you to minister the Holy Spirit. And, and here's what he wants you to do. He wants you to minister the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22, 23. And then 25, he wants you to live that way. He wants you to distribute God's love and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and mercy. He wants you, wants you to spread it out amongst all of that circle of influence in your life every day. Somewhere every day. Are you doing that? Every day of your life. I don't care if you go to the grocery store. I don't care if you go to the service station. You look for people. God didn't send you there just for gas. You do know that, but now don't you? God don't just send you places. Well, I got to go to the grocery store. That's God's excuse to get you out of the house and take you to the grocery store. Look for people. You'd be amazed how many people hurt. You, know, you walk right by and they're just hurting. I said to a lady the other day, I said, I could see sadness in her eyes. I said, I'm about to have eat this breakfast. And I wonder if we could talk. I'm going to have a word of prayer. If anything in your life you want to pray about. And she talks about a, a 10-year-old son that got shot. Think about that. I've seen her before in there. That's the first time she mentioned that. I say that to them all every time I eat. I figure God didn't bring me there just to eat. I could go eat anywhere. Why'd you tell me to go there? Here stands this, is this girl. It's just... She moved to a new neighborhood to get away from the crime. Well, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, just reminding you. I, I say, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not, there's your promise, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These two are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. See, the, the, listen, neither way right, can you do the things you please. So what, what is the first person that you need to get rid of? Not your mate. 
You think that's, what, that's what's creating out here, all your problems. Nah. Your kids, mm-mm. Your job, mm-mm. Nah, nah. Because you see, if I'm over here, I don't get pleased. And if I'm over here, I don't get pleased. Did, did you get that, didn't you? Oh, jeez, come on now. So that you may not do the things that you please. Over here, they're not happy. Over here, they're not happy. So wh what do you have to do? You have to learn to please God. Do you not have to learn that? My, 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 my. Better learn that pretty quick. <laughs> Got to live to please God. You know, that's that Hebrews 11, 7, dealing with faith. Here he's dealing with this Holy Spirit. It's not about pleasing you. It's, listen, this, the Christian experience in life is not about pleasing you. It's not about pleasing you. It's not about pleasing me. It's about pleasing him. When you walk in the spirit, it pleases him because he commanded you and you obeyed. Yes, sir. And he goes, I love that. That's what I love. Now, I love that attitude by leaving the house. Let's see if he can come home that way. Very pateo, walking by means of the flesh, listen to me, is what grieves the Holy Spirit. Up there in filling, you know what grieves the Holy Spirit in the, in the filling? Quenching. Quenching. I wrote it on your paper. I just didn't get to it. I got time conscious. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says quench. Don't quench. Don't put out the fire of the, of the Holy Spirit. Quench. But in walking, it, it's grieve. That's why, look, what he wants out of your life, out of the walking, he wants the fruit. I mean, he tells you that. He just, just go down the page a little ways in Galatians 5, and there you have it. He, he wants that. So what, what he wants, he, he wants, he wants the love in you to be to others. That he said that. That was part of our operative. I want, I want the love of God to go in you and nurture you, and then I want it to go out from you to nurture others. That's what he said in our passage. And so, if Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed. There's a security word until the day of redemption. First, that's first uh, e uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Yeah, don't grieve. They, when, you, when you walk in the flesh, it grieves the Holy Spirit. When, when you're not filled with the Spirit, it quenches it. Quenches it. So learn those. That's important, people. Learn that. Uh, we're going to have a word of prayer. Then we're going to go downstairs. Woo! Going downstairs, have a cup of coffee and celebrate. And have a cup of coffee and a donut or something. And then we'll come back after about 15 minutes. And Ernie has the second service. I have Al and Ernie coming up uh, to get them back in shape uh, in the pulpit and get us going again. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. I pray, Father, that this is not a lesson they can learn in one setting but they can learn it in many settings. They have to read this and study it. Let the Holy Spirit reveal it to them, and they have to walk it out in their life. I pray that today. I, I pray that for them. Uh, the Holy Spirit will teach and recall, John 15. He will teach and recall, he says. Jesus said, I'm going to send it back, and he will teach and recall. And uh, we put this lesson upon that promise in Jesus' name. Amen.